O Fairfield, Fairfield, how art thou, O mighty Fairfield? Uh, Fairfield 2.0 is what you're watching right now, although maybe we should call it Fairfield 2.5, because this is the second half of the second season. Yay! We made it to the second. We haven't been canceled yet. Uh. Yay! Uh, now, where we left off in uh, season two, uh, episode 15, uh, was with your mighty mom and your mighty brother. Uh, cool. Helen and David. So it's only appropriate that we start up the second half of the season with, ladies and gentlemen, drum roll please, Eric uh, Harlan. <laughs> my favorite musician in Fairfield, by the way. Sorry, have to put Thank that out you. there. Um, you're an amazing keyboard player. I'm just going to just compliment you right off the bat and uh, see where it goes from there. Okay. Um, Eric. Yes. In the David Hawthorne tradition, tell us a little something about yourself. <laughs> All right. Well, my name is Eric Herlin, as you have been informed already. Uh, I am here from Fairfield. I went to MSAE preschool to 12th grade. Uh, and I have always played music. I started playing piano when I was seven years old. Um, and then at age 13, I incorporated guitar. At 14, I started playing bass and a little drums because my brother got a drum set. And I've just always been into exploring the field of sound and listening and playing music. And that's what I want to do with my life is, is continue to progress and evolve in the field of music. Now, the, uh, I applaud that answer. <laughs> I, I want to also throw out there that you have been influential as far as uh, an essential. Essential might be another mm -hmm. word we could throw in here. Mm -hmm. As far as the musicians in town, mm -hmm. because you backed up virtually everyone, um, <laughs> especially a lot, of, a lot of people who go through Cafe P, a lot of people who go through the Sondheim. Even when people like Caleb Hawley come to town, they're like, um, where's that Eric guy? We need right. Eric. <laughs> um, so you have become such a, you really are the face of young Fairfield musicianship. Huh. Um, how did, when, when you're, and you have original material, which we're going to hear later. Don't you go anywhere. We're going to hear some original uh. Eric Harlan material. When you create, tell yeah. us where it comes from. How? What is the process like? In other words, you're about to, you feel like you need to maybe run to an instrument and write a song. Mm. How does that, what's that process like? How does that happen for you? Uh, I think there's a kind of variety of ways that it happens, but it usually happens when I'm in, when I'm feeling really good. If my mood is good and I'm feeling clear in my mind, then I'm able to enjoy what I'm doing very easily. And in that enjoyment is where my creativity happens. If I'm not enjoying it, even if I try to be creative, it just doesn't flow. So it's usually when I'm feeling really good and I'm just at the piano and my heart is open that I'm able to catch a little idea and then uh, take that idea and kind of develop it and flush it out into a fuller uh, song. Do you find that some of the um, topics that you're talking about, are they things that are necessarily things that are going on in your life, or are they things that sometimes you just want to talk about? Um, you mean, wait, sorry, yeah, rephrase like, uh, said, wait, you have to, right, <laughs> I should slow things down a little bit, sorry about that, I'm from New York, you know. Uh. Um, if, you're, if you have a topic lyrically that you're oh, writing lyrically. about in a song, okay. Um, is it coming from personal experience, or is it also sometimes just wanting to write some fun lyrics? Right. Or Well, I, I actually write lyrics very rarely. Often I co-write with my brother, and he's an amazing lyricist. But uh, when I do write lyrics, sometimes it's just goofiness. Like, sometimes I'll just, like, kind of, like... Uh, you know, kind of like stream of consciousness, not trying to make too much sense lyrics. I'm pretty good at those. Every once in a while I'll have one that's kind of more about a sincere topic. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't try and stay overly autobiographical, and so I let my imagination kind of go crazy nice. when I'm writing lyrics. Nice. Now, I have to say, you combined recently, you, you added your talents to those of Sharon Busquets mm -hmm. uh, when you guys played a recent event over at the Sondheim. Yeah. I'm pointing over there because it literally is like over there. Right. <laughs> um, uh, she, from her perspective, and I'm going to talk for Sharon for this moment, uh, she really was touched by that. She felt mm -hmm. that that was a special performance. She felt that you, right. together you guys had a very interesting energy and, and, a, and a, a nice synergy. Mm -hmm. 
when you perform with other artists, when yeah. you perform and you're backing up other artists, yeah. what are you feeling? What's going on? Uh, I, I try to keep my ears as wide open as possible. Uh, you know, it's not the kind of thing where it's like, oh, okay, I know the song. Now I can stop listening and just go through it. It's like even when you have learned the song, you still want to keep your ears wide open so that you're able to sync not just even rhythmically but also energetically in the in the present moment in the performance itself so i i just try to keep my ears open and i try to tune in to the vibe of the other person and just make the whole kind of energy of the song feel right okay so when you're working with your brother yeah i'll bet you it's the same kind of thing going on maybe even more extreme because right. you guys trust each other and know each other for your lives right so that what happens when you're with your brother as far as like all of a sudden breaking into uh, writing a song together or jamming on a yeah. on something original how does that work well we we complement <laughs> each other very well in the songwriting process um because i i'm often the one that comes up with the initial spark of, of the idea for a song and then he's really good at helping me to organize that and to flush it out and to kind of arrange it and nurture it into like you know a full you know song um, it's not always that way sometimes he has the initial spark and I help so you know arrange it and flush it out so it's not we don't have set roles but oftentimes it kind of works that way and we work just very, we kind of work very quickly and effortlessly. It's just like, oh, here's an idea. And then he's like, oh, what if we did this with it and arranged it this way and layered it over here? And then it's like, before you know it, we have a little track. And it happens pretty quickly and, and seamlessly. Nice. Now, you've played with so many configurations with your brother. Uh, in right. addition to being with just your brother, you've played in something called the Tantric... <laughs> something boys choir the apocalypso tantric boys choir uh, okay yes <laughs> um and that's with uh, jimmy moore from uh, kruu yes uh what goes on in those dynamics um it's <clears throat> it's it's a combination of pre-composed material but there's also a whole lot of jamming that band is kind of a jam band you know we 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 have songs um that are some mostly through compose but for the most part it's just like pick a key go see where it goes and it's it's a lot of fun i i find it almost very uh meditative to just be in in a space that's really free um i don't like to live there all of the time i like to because i also like you know working on structures and forms and things like that but it's nice to go into that free space every now and then just to kind of like you know, dive in and, and see what happens. Nice. Now, that group, that particular configuration, yeah. is a little influenced by a certain other group, right? Right. What would that group be again? Um, Medeski, Martin, and Wood. Thank you, and I'm glad you said it because I always flip Martin and Medeski. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I never know which one is it. Uh. Um, they have some of these tendencies too, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you feel that they're coming from, in a lot of ways, do you feel like they're coming from that same creative uh, element that you guys are coming from. In other words, they influenced you a little bit, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, do you feel like you're picking up on their vibe of how they did it and that's sort of getting imbibed with the three of you also? Yeah, I feel like I feel like they kind of in a way like embody kind of a generation of 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 jam band style cuz cuz I feel like we certainly have a tendency to sound like them or, or you know, be in their vibe. But I, I hear a lot of other bands, that I, I don't know if I can list the names, but I, but I feel like they kind of, in a way, they kind of created a genre um, or, or, or they were kind of the band that became most associated with that genre, whether they created it or not is, yeah. is another story. But we definitely fall in the same sort of vibe and, you know, it's... Uh, I love listening to them. Nice. Uh. And there are other configurations you've been a part of. You're, yes. you're a part of um, uh, your uh, trillionaires. Um, who's in trillionaires again? Well, I'm more of an honorary trillionaires <laughs> member. I'm not. I'm not actually a core member of that band, but I, I play with them every now and then. Um, the other band that is like kind of the most serious one right now is 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 a is 
me, my brother, and uh, another guitar player, Johnny Cohen. Who? <laughs> Johnny who? <laughs> Mr. Cohen. <laughs> so that's kind of um, perhaps the most serious ensemble at this point, but also uh, Johnny's sister, Gemma, uh, sings with us, and that band, we have a name, it's called the Subterranean All-Stars, and I really, really love playing in that band because we get to perform a lot of original material and we all just play very well together. And it's also inspirational, isn't it, as far as the way that uh, the, the creative, what everybody's adding to the to the pot. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I notice it, especially with the original songs and all that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, it looks like we need to be looking at um, winding this down because we need to hear you play. All it's like all of this, it's like the tension <laughs> building before the performance. Sounds uh, good. Eric, this is great. I'm really happy that you know you joined us today. Um, Thank you. Uh, I want to know, however, before we end this, what advice do you have? This is my traditional question. Okay. Bryce, what advice do you have for new artists? New artists. Um, be dedicated and, and be in it for the long run. Uh, because I think in the development of any artistic talent and skill that you go through dry spells and you go through periods where the inspiration is low, but have the attitude of like a long distance runner that is that, and, and be willing to go through those phases because when you come out on the other side, you're that much stronger and you're that much uh, wiser as an artist. Um, so just be dedicated and see it, see it as an eternal process of evolving and don't get discouraged when you feel like you're stagnating for like a period just because in the bigger picture that's just a phase and everyone if you put your attention on it will feel that sense of progress and nice yeah. <laughs> sage words from a musical oh. sage. Right. Um, thank you very, very much, thank Eric, you. for coming on the show. Absolutely. And um, definitely come back again. Um, and now, don't go away, we're going to be having Eric Herlin play some uh, original music, a couple of covers, right? A couple awesome. covers, yeah. And uh, you don't want to miss it, so stay tuned. Hang in there, Fairfield. Hello, Fairfield. My name is Eric Herlin, and I will be playing few songs for you, uh, four originals, two covers, and one just improv jam that was requested by Mike. Um, so for the first one, uh, I don't, two of the originals don't have names. The first one doesn't have a name, uh, but I actually wrote it on accordion and then later transferred it to piano and uh, hopefully one day it'll have a nice name for it. So here it goes.
it for this next song. This song is an original. Uh, it does have a name. It's called Mr. Bear. And I wrote it when I was did a semester at Berkeley College of Music in Boston for a music theory class. Uh, later, we did it in a band I was in called Rock, Paper, Scissors with uh, three vocalists. But I also like to play it instrumental every now and then. So here it is. So this third song, uh, I also wrote at Berkeley, and I also did with Rock, Paper, Scissors. It's a slow ballad, and it's called the Moonlight Song. Not Moonlight Sonata, just so you know. Okay.
For my last original, this one again doesn't have a title, but it's just a simple little blues head that I'll be doing some improvising over. So here it goes. So now I'm going to attempt to play a couple of Charlie Parker songs. Uh, he's a big influence of mine. And this first one is called Scrapple for the Apple. So here it goes.
This next one is a uh, blues by Charlie Parker. It's called A Prevave. Now I'm going to go for a just a straight improv, see what happens. I'm going to get a little different sound going on. Something a little funkier than a straight piano. I'm going to clab with a wah-wah. That <laughs> sounds like a duck, but let's see what happens. <laughs> so I'll just do like something kind of funky and... See where it goes.
Thank you very much, Fairfield. Hope you enjoyed. Hello, Fairfield. Ready for another exciting segment of today's episode of Fairfield 2.0? Well, I hope you are because we've got Molly Ringwald. Yeah, it's true, Molly Ringwald. I'm interviewing Molly uh, via Skype, that thing that's all the rage with the kids uh, these days. And um, hang in there. This is an experiment, and I hope it works because uh, we're going to probably be doing more of this in the future. So here is our interview uh, with Molly Ringwald here on Fairfield 2.0. Oh, lucky Fairfield, we have with us Molly Ringwald on the line uh, for Fairfield 2.0 and beyond. Um, hi, I'm Molly. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm pretty good, and I'm really grateful to have this time with you, and so is, uh, I guess, uh, so are all the listeners right now. Um, would you do me a favor and go into um, your new album, uh, Except Sometimes, on Concord. Mm -hmm. uh, what inspired you to do this album? Uh, what inspired me? Well, mostly it was because I was uh, playing with these incredible performers. Um, I put a jazz group together, and uh, this was around 2008, uh, 2009, and we just had a great time together. And, um, you know, we were sort of gigging around town until I was, I think, about eight months pregnant. <laughs> and then I took a little break uh, and then picked it up when they were about Six, I have twins, uh, three and a half year old twins, and uh, we picked it up and just decided that it was kind of like now or never, you know, while we were performing together, we just wanted to, I wanted to really get a record of, of our sound and what we were doing, and, and that's kind of how it happened. And we made the choice to do it independently, so we didn't have to go through kind of like all the meetings and people deciding for us what we wanted to do. You know, Peter and I, he's, he's my um, pianist and musical director and arranges all the music. We just kind of wanted to do it the way that we wanted to do it and then see kind of after the fact who was interested. And nowadays it's like you don't really need a label. You know, we could have released it independently, but we were absolutely thrilled when Concord Jazz um, really got behind it. Yeah, they're an amazing label. They've got so much good talent and they're willing to take some risks. They're really cool. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and, and an incredible, you know, back story, you know, with, with amazing performers. I think, you know, I'm really, really proud to, to have them release the album. Yeah, now you mentioned Peter before. You met Peter Smith, right? Mm-hmm, Peter Smith. Right, and who else joined you on this project? Uh, we have our, our, what we consider kind of our core group um, is uh, Clayton Cameron on drums and Trevor Ware on bass and uh, Alan Mesquita on sax. And then on a couple of other tracks, um, we have a man named Winston Bird who plays trumpet, and uh, Bruce Foreman on guitar. And, um, yeah, and that's pretty much... Uh, oh, and Charlie. Uh, Charlie joins on um, I'll Take Romance. Cool. Now, you, you, this is not new for you uh, as far as music. Uh, what are, what's the story? What's your musical history? Um, well, my father is a traditional jazz musician. Uh, and so I grew up, you know, before I did anything else, the, the very first, uh, my very first artistic endeavor was uh, singing jazz with my father's band, uh, the Fulton Street Jazz Band. And I started when I was about three and a half. And, um, and that's really where I thought my focus was going to be. I thought I was going to grow up and be a, um, actually, I thought I was going to grow up and become a black jazz singer. <laughs> my, my idol was Bessie Smith, and that's who I really, really adored. And that was the music that I listened to, and that was the music that I sang with my dad. I mean, a couple of the, the lyrics, they sort of had to, you know, change a little bit to make it a little bit more appropriate for me. Right. But, you know, I really thought that that's what I was going to do, you know, because that's what my dad did. My father raised his kids as, as a jazz musician, so I thought that was a really viable career. Um, and then I uh, became interested in acting, and then, you know, in the 80s, I really kind of felt like I had to make a decision. You know, it wasn't really, there weren't really a lot of musicals then, and a lot of crossover, um, and I kind of thought that I had to make my decision, and I and I chose acting. Right. Um, we'll get to that in a second. I kept singing. You bet you kept singing. I, we'll I get... kept singing kind of privately, you know, with my with my dad's band or with a you know with you know the the rave ups this you know sort of more alternative band and 
you know, and then I and then I did some musical musical theater, but um, but I was really dying to get my own jazz group together. Um, it was always something that I wanted to do, um, and when it when it all came together, it just sort of felt like my dream come true. Nice. Now let's look at some of the titles that you chose for this project. Uh, by the way, if anybody's joining us right now, uh, we're talking with Molly Ringwald with a new album, Except Sometimes. Um, uh, Except Sometimes. First of all, okay. let's go there. The title Except Sometimes. Where does it come from? Yes. Well, uh, I sing a song uh, on the album that, that um, some people know called um, I Get Along Without You Very Well, mm -hmm. uh, written by Hokie Carmichael. And uh, I, I always thought it was kind of an interesting story. If you've read anything about him, he, um, you know, amazing lyricist, amazing composer. And he it, apparently the way the story goes, at least this is what it says in his biography, um, somebody gave him a poem called Except Sometimes when he was at the Indiana University, or I believe he, he taught, and he, I think he was from Indiana as well. Um, and he liked the poem, um, and he wrote a song based on it, but then when it came time to publish it, he had absolutely no idea who had written the poem. Um, and, what, and this is a time before Internet, before Facebook, before YouTube, you know, what do you do when you need this information? Because he really couldn't publish the song without the credit, you know, because he's pretty faithful to the poem. Mm -hmm. I mean, he improved upon it, but he's pretty faithful to it. Uh, so he enlisted the assistance of Walter Winchell, um, who went on the radio and said, you know, if, you wrote, if you're the author of this poem, come forward. And he read the poem and he said, you know, and we'll tell your Uncle Hoagie and you can be famous. Um, and, and a lot of people came forward and they couldn't be verified. But then the, the woman who actually wrote the poem did come forward and she was a 70-something-year-old widow in Philadelphia named Jane Brown Thompson. Um, and she was the one who wrote the poem. So in the original publication, it says written by Hoagie Carmichael um, and J.B. I don't know if they've changed the... We're trying to actually figure that out because on the I just saw the first uh, copy of the, the credits on my album and it just said Hoagie Carmichael. And I said, hang on, where's J.B.? <laughs> Uh, so we're we're looking, and I, I don't know if the rules change, you know, over the years with the publication and all of that. But um, anyway, that's where I got the title from. Nice. And a lot of times, including on my album, it says I get along without you very well, and then in parentheses it says except sometimes. Nice. And that's where I got the name from. That was a very long answer to a pretty short question. But there you go. <laughs> no, that's an interesting story. <laughs> that, that was the most informative answer, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I really love it. Thank you so much. I the other another, let's go over a couple of more songs on this project. I'm mm -hmm. I believe, and you tell me if I'm wrong, that maybe some of these songs were songs that you learned when you were when you were younger, maybe playing with your dad. Um, and uh, as far as the songs on the track list, where did where did these come from? Like how you know if, you, if for instance, are any of them particularly uh, really special? to you, I mean, they're all special, obviously, but which, are there any which really resonate with you from, like, a real personal level? Um, you know, most of these songs um, that I sing on the album, I I did not perform with my father because my dad and my father is really a traditional jazz musician, um, and my band is really much more modern. Um, you know, I really sing more from the American Songbook, but musically, I would say that they kind of fall more under the, the hard bop category. Um, and that's just not what my dad does at all. So when I perform with my dad, you know, I really do kind of more Dixieland and, you know, I'll sing like more Fats Waller songs, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then when I'm with my band, I, you know, do these songs. So um, um, in terms of what I, my song choice, it was really hard because there's so many incredible songs that my band and I performed together. But it really was, it was a matter of the, the lyrics had to really speak to me in some way. Um, you know, they, they had to be, you know, fun to sing. Um, they couldn't be, you know, sometimes the, the music is great, but then the lyrics don't really come together, you know. And for me, it, it, it had to be all of it, you know. Um, so... I'm trying to think of, you know, the, the, the set list, a uh, few examples, you know, that sooner or later mm -hmm. I chose, which is the, the Sondheim song. Um, and I chose that specifically a little bit as a joke because I was up for that movie. You know, my agents were um, called about my availability to play the part of Breathless Mahoney and Dick Tracy. And then I didn't get the part and I was so upset about it. Um, 
So in my mind, I thought if I ever recorded an album, I had to record that song. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's funny because Concord ended up re you know, they resequenced the album from what I had originally sequenced, and they put that one first. So um, I guess they really like it. Uh, uh, but that was kind of a little bit of a wink to Warren Beatty, um, who I actually think in the album because he's one of the people over the years who's been incredibly uh, supportive of me and my singing um, and has always said I had to do something with it. So, um, you know, and then there's the song, The Ballad of the Sad Young Men, which is, I think, an absolutely beautiful song that um, uh, I've heard Anita O'Day sing. But it's one of those ones you don't really hear that often. Um the very thought of you, you hear, I would say that you probably hear that song more than most, but I really loved the arrangement that Peter did, you know, that really simple bass line, da, 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 you know, yeah. and it just kind of runs the whole thing. It just, uh, when I, when I heard that, I, I really kind of fell in love with it. Um, you know, and then there's J'attendrai, which I believe is not on the, you probably didn't hear that. That's going to be a bonus track, um, on, I think French and uh, and American iTunes. Nice, um, nice. I, I, you know, the ballad of the sad young man. I want to go to that because it seems like such a that was a challenging. Uh, you handle it wonderfully, but it was a challenging choice. I mean, that the way that that song goes and the depth and the and the sort of like um, sort of the the level of. Well, what you're singing about, what you're communicating. But then again, I realized that you've been in so many movies with sad young men. It doesn't. <laughs> it absolutely resonates. Yeah. Yeah, I used to actually not be able to get through that song um, without crying. <laughs> when when Peter and I first started to uh, to perform that together, um, I I could I could not get through it without getting overly emotional. And you know, there's a very delicate balance between uh, you know, same goes for acting. You know, you want to be able to communicate emotion, but not get so emotional that you can't actually sing. Um, but, you know, and I finally got it to that place where, where it should be, where I was, I was still on pitch and singing, but still felt very connected to it. But, uh, it's, it's just an extraordinarily beautiful song. Um, it was written for a musical, um, called, I think the nervous set that was about, uh, bohemians, uh, kind of in the, um, not, not bohemians, I think like the beat, the beat poets. Right. Um. Uh, in in the 60s and i've never heard actually the all of the songs from from that which i, I would love to hear because that's such a beautiful song right. now you know where that leads us to that leads us to the present song the album closer uh the song don't you forget about me mm-hmm. which is which is amazing that you did this take this kind of take on on that song which you know uh the simple minds version of course is the classic uh, you know, way we remember it, but your take on this is 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 sort of as revolutionary, I would say, as when um, Mad World was redone. Um, uh-huh. Why would now? What what what? How did you hear this? Was it just because it was the connection with the uh, Breakfast Club, or is or does that song kind of like resonate with you because it does mean something in your life on a very deep level? Well, I really think the reason why we did it was because. Um, when we recorded the album, it really wasn't that long after John Hughes had passed away. Um, and, you know, he was on my mind a lot. And I wanted to, I don't know, I just, I felt like I wanted to record that album, um, but but do it, I mean, I wanted to record that song, but do it in a completely different way. Um, you know, I, it just, it was kind of meaningful also for me to do it and show that you can do something like that in a completely different way. You know, that time passes and, and, you know, and time has passed for me and I'm, you know, I'm, I I wouldn't say I'm a different person, but I'm, I've definitely evolved. You know, I don't really believe in reinvention. I believe in, in evolution. (laughs) Nice. And, uh, you know, and I, and I thought it would be interesting to, to just hear that song in such a different way different way um and the song was meaningful to me you know i remember when when they were when the first time i heard it when i when i first heard the the, um you know the demo when they brought it when we were filming in chicago and and when simple minds agreed to record it it was it was really exciting um so that's pretty much why i did that it's the only song on the album really that's um 
that's modern at all. You know, the rest of them are, are you know, straight American songbook, with the exception of Jaton Play. Hmm. Right. Well, you have the other thing I wanted to point out is that you have, and, and a lot of our, a lot of the people who are listening understand this, and I think would agree, is that you're an icon uh, of the '80s. Although you know your career definitely expands before, uh, expands beyond that. Uh, but I, you know, you were in so many classic movies. For instance, we were just talking about a, referencing sort of the, the Breakfast Club. Um, okay. When you, uh, you know, I guess you get asked this a lot, but when you look back at those years, what are your thoughts now? What are my thoughts? Yeah, how do you... I have a lot of thoughts. (laughs) It would be impossible to synopsize, uh, you know, I think think things differently every day. I mean, sometimes I don't think about it at all. Um, I guess my main thought right now is, is I'm sort of amazed that they are still so relevant, that people still care about them so much. Um, You know, I mean, I like the movie. I, I always loved those movies, but it's, Kind of remarkable that they've reached the iconic status that they have, um, and I'm also really looking forward to my kids seeing them. My 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 nine year old um, has seen Sixteen Candles, but she hasn't seen Breakfast Club yet. So <laughs> I'm really kind of looking forward to that, and I want her to see it soon because she's already she's already seen the um, the takeoff, you know, the the parody that they did on that show Victorious. So she's seen a lot of the jokes, but actually hasn't seen the movie. So right. I feel like I really have to kind of show her the movie. Yeah, and the amazing thing is you'll also be showing her things like, um, I guess, King Lear and oh, some of the other things. Oh, she'd never make it through King Lear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind maybe of a joke. she might be able to explain it to me, but I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's something she'll probably study in college. Right, exactly. She does cinema courses in college. You're saving it for then. And then, of course, but the, you know, just to remind everybody who's listening, we have things like Pretty in Pink. With Sixteen Candles, of course, Breakfast Club, uh, Fresh Horses, a uh, pickup artist. Okay. Some folks call it uh, call it a sling blade. Um, okay. I mean, it, your career has been amazing. But in addition to your film career, you're also a, you're also a writer. That's right. Um, mm-hmm. How do you can you go into that a little bit? Like, what inspired you when you first decided when you first you know had your inspiration for writing? Well, it's something like singing that I've done all along. Um, I just never really necessarily thought that I would do it professionally. Um, I just, it's just something that's always been very important to me. I've just always been writing. Um, and I don't know, this, something happened, I think, when I turned 40, where I just, it kind of kicked me into this really super high creative gear, mm. <laughs> where I felt like I just, I really wanted to do everything that I wanted to do. Mm. And, um, you know, so I just, took it really seriously and sat down and, you know, I wrote two books. The first one is nonfiction, um, much more sort of lighter kind of style guy that's illustrated. It's really fun. And then my second book was um, a work of fiction, novel and stories called When It Happens to You. Mm-hmm. And that was uh, all along the, uh, the theme of betrayal, which I felt like was a very relatable kind of human theme. Mm. Yeah. And, you, and there's also, of course, your Broadway career. Yes, which I haven't really done. And, you know, we moved to L.A. Uh, in 2008, and I haven't really been back to do anything on Broadway. I'd like to, but it's kind of hard now with three kids, you know, in school. Yeah. Are they, Are they? by the way, are they edging towards music? Do you find any of them more musical than uh, uh, wanting to follow mom's path a little? You know, it's really hard to tell. My, my elder daughter takes piano lessons. Uh, and she's very talented. She doesn't like to practice, um, <laughs> but she's really talented. My my littlest girl, um, three and a half, uh, loves to dance, and my um, my little boy seems to be leaning towards the piano. So, you know, who knows? I, I think they're going to tell me what they want to do. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, so this segs nicely into my cr- traditional question, which is, what advice do you have for new artists? You know, I, I kind of make it a policy not to have advice. <laughs> I feel like everybody needs to follow their own path and really needs to listen to their own core, um, which I guess is a kind of advice, yeah. you know. Um, not listen so much to what other people have to say. If you really feel strongly about something, then you just have to do it. Nice. Um and I, I really think that that's really the most important thing. And getting an education, I think that really, really is a good thing. Nice. Um, <laughs> would you educate us in uh, maybe if you could? I've never read anywhere about any kind of, you know, any um, 
um, relationships that were happening on any of the sets. But as you're, you know, you're a young actor and actress and all that, and, and sometimes there'll be attractions. Were there any attractions happening on some of the sets that you've worked on over the years that... Oh, I never talk about that. <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess that's... A, that, <laughs> that's a that's a kiss and tell question, but I was just curious if uh, you know, I mean, the, your chemistry with Rob Lowe, for instance, <laughs> you know. Yeah, no. No, okay, no. but and I have to, but I want to throw out there uh, uh, the uh, Stephen King uh, TV novelization. Mm -hmm. um, was the stand. oh yeah, that was real. I thought that was a sweet. I thought that was really pretty cool. Um, and I think yeah, it, it was a great cast. Yeah, and it it had a um, and it had a nice. I think some of the messages even in that were really cool. Uh -huh. um, By the way, before I forget, I, I when I was listening uh, the the band members, um, I just blanked on Charlie's last name. He plays tenor sax on "I'll Take Romance," and his name is Charles Owen. So I wanted to make sure that he got that credit. Beautiful. Okay. And speaking of that, are you going to be going on tour to support the record? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Nice. Have you People got... will be able to uh, check on my website, um, which is immollyringwald.com, and there's a calendar section that um, we try to be pretty faithful about. Um, I say we as my husband because he's much more computer savvy than I am, but we try to keep it uh, updated. Nice. All right, and then I have to ask you, did you enjoy your gig on January 15th at 54 Below in New York? Yeah, I had a great time. Yeah, it was really nice. Nice. All right, Molly, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, all Thank the you. all the best, Molly Ringwald. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hello, Fairfield. Welcome to the last segment of Fairfield 2.0. And uh, I want to throw one last thing out there for you, which is a song I wrote in the 80s called Simple Man. Um, it's a country song. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll be singing along with this thing by the end. Um, but let's, uh, let's get into this. This is a song I wrote uh, for a certain girl that I knew back in the 80s um, from her perspective, but I kind of gave it a twist and made it from the third person in order for a guy to sing it. So uh, let's see what we do with this. Let's see. His heart was gentle his knees were few His eyes were the color of his faded jeans And his love was true Her heart was broken Her dreams were through He took her by surprise with some tender words When he said, I love you Her mama used to tell her, settle down with a simple man you want and he'll give you all the love he can was she wise or a fool to throw away the best love and that she ever had she wanted more from life she needed more than a simple man she lived in the city where men Find. How you gonna keep her down on the farm after hors d'oeuvres and wine? Well, his conversation bored her sometimes. But Lord, he could touch her in those tender hours and make love with style. Her mama used to tell her, settle down with a simple man. What you want and he'll give you all the love he can Was she wise or a fool to throw away the best love and that she ever had She wanted more from life, she needed more than a simple man Saying goodbye was so easy So easy she never cried Maybe she should have settled down and lived a simple life. Well, she's made her choices, some good, some bad. 
Her heart is like a book and she's turned many pages since she held that man. And she loves her freedom. She's got big plans. But after all her lovers, no others touched her like that simple man. Her mama used to tell her, settle down with a simple man. What you want and he'll give you all the love he can Was she wise or a fool to throw away the best loving that she ever had She wanted more from life, she needed more than a simple man